Well, we're in Ephesians 6.10, so we kind of turn a corner now to this whole uh, uh, idea of spiritual warfare. Uh, that last section began uh, back uh, with uh, Paul's statement in chapter 4 about uh, walking worthy uh, of the calling, uh, which meant to uh, you know, let your walk match your talk, basically. And he talked about personal issues uh, in our own lives uh, and our attitudes and so forth. He dealt with uh, the family, he dealt with marriage and kids and, uh, in the workplace. Uh, and now we turn a corner uh, to deal with this whole a- episode of spiritual warfare. Uh, and this is kind of the introduction, verses uh, 10 to three, 13, just three verses. Uh, then we'll come back over the next two consecutive uh, Sundays uh, and deal with the, uh, the actual putting on the full armor of God as he describes that. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, uh, the metaphor from which that comes, certainly, and what it actually means uh, in our lives uh, practically. To kind of introduce us, I always think about uh, taking uh, our kids when they were when they were really small uh, and uh, going to a UH football game. Uh, I can tell you how long ago it was. It only cost five fifty for an end zone seat. That's how long ago it was. <coughs> you know that I actually remember the price. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, you know they they loved going to the games, and we we'd go a couple three times at that price. We'd go a couple three times during <laughs> during the season. Uh, but when they went for the boiled peanuts, uh, they, 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 they went for all the food. And, uh, and they loved to watch what was going down on the field you know, before the game. And they loved it when people would throw confetti. And they loved all that stuff. I think uh, they were so young, they were pretty much oblivious to the, the fact that there was actually a football game being played uh, in between all the inter- entertainment that, that took place. And I'm afraid that sometimes uh, as Christians, or there are Christians, uh, that have that perspective when it comes to spiritual warfare. Now, uh, Paul's going to tell us that we should put on the full armor of God. Before he even gets into us, he tells us why. He says there is a struggle that's being fought in the heavenlies. Uh, and he says there is a specific scheme uh, against, uh, against your life. And that's pretty much our, uh, our two points that we want to uh, look at uh, this morning. A couple of uh, statistics that I, that I thought was, uh, was uh, interesting. This is from a, a Barna Group study of uh, several years ago uh, that said of Americans that call themselves, refer themselves as Christians, uh, that uh, 40% said that Satan is not a living being, but simply a symbol of evil. Now, those are the, the people that are <laughs> they're like my kids at the football game. They're in denial that there is a, a struggle, a spiritual struggle uh, that's going on. <laughs> 58% of Americans who call themselves Christians either strongly agree or agree somewhat that the Holy Spirit is simply a symbol of God's power or presence, but not a living entity. That's almost 60% of people that call themselves Christians. That was a few years ago. I don't think it's gotten better. It's probably uh, gotten worse. Some are unaware of the battle, uh, and some don't even believe there's a battle even, even taking place. One writer noted that from evolutionary theory to Marxist philosophy, from radical prejudice to multiculturalism, from gang violence to world wars, from the sexual revolution to AIDS, from broken homes to the violent crime epidemic, from alcoholism to drug addictions, Satan's work is evident. The hatred and violence, the death and destruction, the pain and the misery from the beginning of history until today are all to a large degree due to the activity of the devil. And I would agree with that statement. Uh, And again, if uh, if you're in some denial that this struggle is going on, then uh, you're certainly going to be very open to the attack of it. Uh, the Apostle John said, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 9. It's certainly one of uh, Satan's most uh, uh, excellent strategies uh, is to get people in that position of denial uh, to not believe that he exists as a personal entity uh, and that there is no struggle going on. Uh, in C.S. Lewis' classic work about this, this struggle and the spiritual warfare uh, in an allegorical form called Screwtape uh, Letters, uh, he says the following, The demons hail with delight the materialists who disbelieve their existence. And certainly uh, there are those that are out there, but the Bible's very clear that we're at a war with an unseen world. Uh, we're referred to as soldiers in 2 Timothy 2.3. Suffer hardship with me, Paul says, is a good soldier of Christ. Notice it's a soldier, not a basket weaver. 
uh, and it means a common warrior, a foot soldier, somebody in the infantry. Uh, that's, that's the idea. So this morning is the, the introduction. There is a struggle going on, and there is a very specific scheme against us, understanding that, and then Paul will go on to say, therefore put on the full armor of God. Well, let's look at verses 10 to 13, our text for this morning. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. <clears throat> put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. <laughs> Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done, done all to stand. So we notice first there's an urgency uh, to take in this stand, and we see that that's indicated by the word uh, finally. Paul spent all this time uh, beginning the epistle, as you re can remember back that far, about the riches that we have in Christ Jesus uh, in, in the heavenlies and so forth. He's talked about our salvation by grace and how important that is to know that. And then all these other practical aspects of living the Christian life. Uh, but he comes to this word finally, and it's as if he is saying that and finally, uh, although all these other things have been so awesome, they've been so important, but finally, if you don't get this, I don't want to say that those things are meaningless, but it's going to affect how you view everything else that he's said so far. Uh, the word finally here uh, means that it's critical uh, that we understand this idea uh, to stand. Uh, secondly, there's an insistence to stand in power. Uh, we can do one of two things when it comes to spiritual warfare. We can have said we can deny its existence. Uh, we can become overoccupied by it. It can be uh, every time you walk down the street and a, a gate squeaks, uh, you're pretty sure that gate uh, has a demon in it. And uh, I actually know people like that. Uh, uh, we can become preoccupied. You know, every, everything is the devil's fault and so forth. Uh, or we can deny existence. And both of those things are, are not good. But what we need to do when it comes to spiritual warfare is stand in the power of God. Now, Paul mentions this power right at the beginning, chapter 1 uh, of our same letter, uh, verse 18 of chapter 1. Uh, he says, the, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. He says, I'm writing this letter, and it's for several things. Uh, and one of it is that you might know and understand uh, the power of God uh, in your lives. And, uh, and we all need, uh, we need God's power in our lives. And, and certainly, uh, we are no match for the enemy in terms of spiritual warfare, but he is no match for the power of God. And that's the uh, important thing to remember. Uh, Paul gives us a, a, an important formula, uh, a, maybe a familiar verse in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, this idea that we can actually trade our weaknesses for God's power. And certainly we should uh, desire to do that. There he says of his own personal afflictions and battles against the enemy, he says, and he said to me, God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, that's what we're talking about, is power in our lives, my strength is made perfect when we've got it all together, no, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, uh, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most <laughs> gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in infirmities, uh, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Uh, we really need God's power in the battle. We need to stand in his power. We're no match for the enemy, uh, but he's no match for God's power. Uh, but it's uh, important that I recognize, admit to my own weakness. As long as I've got it together and I can do my thing and I'm okay, uh, I'm really set up to be attacked by the enemy. Uh, if I see my weakness and my dependence upon him, and, and uh, praise God, some of the songs we, we sang this morning uh, talked about that. Uh, in our weakness and, uh, and so forth, and our need for God's power. In order to apply God's, uh, Paul's teaching on spiritual warfare, we have to realize our own weakness and then exchange it for uh, the power of God. 
uh, we are to stand in his mighty power. So again, the stand is critical. It's indicated by the word finally. There's an insistence to stand in God's power. Uh, and then thirdly, there's a need for our involvement in standing. Uh, in the context of going through spiritual warfare, uh, dealing with trials and difficulties, uh, James writes this in James 4, 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, again, if you don't think you're ever attacked by the devil uh, or his cohorts, as he's described for us in terms of principalities and so forth, this may be meaningless. Uh, but when you're going through something of... Uh, over the top a difficulty uh, in your life and you really sense something's going on, James says in those times we are to submit to God, resist the devil, and the good news is that he will flee from us. We're to draw near to God during those times, and guess what? He will draw near to us. Uh, so again, is the resisting and the submitting something we do or something the Lord does for us? It's something we do. Uh, you and I have to choose to recognize uh, that there's a game going on in that field. It should be pretty obvious if we'll just look down there at a law stadium in the middle of a football game. If we'll get our eyes off our circumstances long enough and begin to think about it and pray about it and get into God's word, we'll recognize those times that we're in spiritual warfare. Uh, and when we do, we can exchange our weakness for, for God's power. Uh, we, can, we can choose to resist the devil. Uh, we can choose to submit to God, uh, and uh, Satan will flee from us. Peter, in speaking in the same context about spiritual warfare, in 1 Peter 5, 8 says to uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood, uh, in the world. So the standing, the resisting, is something we do. Uh, we exchange our weakness for God's power because there's a real enemy. He's referred to as Lucifer. He's referred to as the devil. He's referred to as Satan. And apparently he has uh, works in concert with, uh, uh, again, those other fallen angels or demonic entities that he has described. Uh, and he's like a roaring lion seeking who he may uh, devour. Uh, but uh, we can resist him and he will flee. So there's an urgency in this idea of taking a stand. Secondly, there is a warning against the scheme. And I think this is uh, probably greatly misunderstood uh, by most believers. We know first the scheme is a particular plan, verse 11, to stand against the wiles uh, of the devil. Wiles is not a word that we typically use in our conversation unless we're, maybe we're just describing our children. But uh, wiles or schemes denotes craft, deceit, a cunning device. Uh, the idea is don't underestimate the enemy. Don't underestimate uh, the devil. Uh, the book of Job gives us uh, tremendous insights, and again, into this whole realm of uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, we have uh, uh, Satan uh, appearing before uh, God at one point in time, Job 1, 8, 9. It says, uh, uh, have you considered my servant Job? God is saying to Satan, have you considered my, certain, uh, my servant Job? And Satan says, who? <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. Who? No, he says, he says uh, Satan answered, does Job fear God for you for nothing? As soon as he says his name, Satan, Satan not only says, I know exactly who you're talking about. I've been stalking this guy for a long time. I'll tell you what, this is how I can get to him. You take away his health. You take away this. He won't praise you anymore. You just let me at him. You remove that head of protection. I'll show you who he really is because I've watched him and I've watched his life and I've watched his family. I know this guy and I can take him down. Does that kind of frighten you that, that, that Satan would say that about any one of us? Uh, there is a particular plan against us. Satan studied Job. He stalked him. He had a scheme in mind. He had a specific plan. We often say to people, you know, the Bill Bright, uh, you know, uh, rule number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's true. <laughs> Satan hates you, and he has a destructive plan uh, plotted uh, just for your life as well. No wonder Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength uh, of his might. Uh, he has a custom plan uh, for each and every one of us. And we certainly see this in a very classic sense in the life of David. 
You know, David starts out as a young, young shepherd boy, you know, just solid in the Lord. Uh, he defeats Goliath by, uh, by the faith that, that he has in, uh, in God. Uh, he becomes one of the leading military uh, 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 leaders and, uh, and a, a national hero uh, in terms of his military exploits against the Philistines uh, uh, in, uh, in Israel. Uh, you know, he becomes uh, good friends with Jonathan and so forth. Jonathan recognizes uh, David uh, should be the next king. We call Jonathan the prince that never was. Uh, he was in line for the throne. He says, no, that's God's man there. And then all the, the battles with uh, Saul against uh, David and you, uh, you have uh, 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 Satan watching the life of David through this whole time. Does he attack him as a young shepherd boy when he's out writing the Psalms? It's just, it's just him, him and God. That's all he's got. He's, he's uh, ostracized by his family. Uh, his father doesn't even count him worthy to be called one of his sons. His older brothers do nothing but ridicule and harass him all the time. I'd say David is in a place of weakness, wouldn't you? But in him, he was strong in the Lord. Satan doesn't mess with him then. He waits till he's much older. He waits till he's very successful. He watches his life through the years. He knows that he can get to him through a woman. He's watched him break God's law by marrying many women, accepted culturally. Everybody accepted it. It was no big deal. It was done in that world and so forth. But it was wrong, and it was wrong every time. And Satan knew it, and Satan watched David. Uh, and then we have the episode in 2 Samuel 11. 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon uh, and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The king lying there is in is verse 11. It happened in the spring of the year when kings go off to war. Now that, that seems very strange to us because we don't live in a kingdom. Uh, but uh, in this day and age, and in those kinds of places, the king needed to go off to war. Why? That he literally was the commander in chief. Uh, and if he didn't go off with his men, if he didn't fight with his men, his men are the army. They could just take over the whole country. <laughs> the, the guy that, ra that ran, ran the military, as, as we've seen <laughs> in countries in the Middle East, just recently, they could decide, I don't think we like you anymore there, Mr. Prime Minister, President, or whatever you call yourself, we're just going to take right over. And guess what? We've got all the guns and we can do it. Uh, th this is the setting in the ancient world. Uh, David is supposed to be with his men. He's supposed to be going into battle, but he's not. He's gotten complacent. He doesn't care anymore. Uh, he's not where he's supposed to be. He's not doing what God's calling him to be. And Satan says, all right, I got him. And he sets this whole thing up. He waits decades and decades, but he had a particular plan, a scheme for the life uh, of David. I hope that scares you to death, because it's meant to be. That's, that's Paul's idea. He says, I'm going to tell you how to put on the full armor of God, but I'm going to give you, I, I want you to understand why you need to be doing this, because uh, it's important. I know a pastor that uh, uh, I'd, uh, ministered in his church several times, wonderful guy. In his 70s, he, he fell into sin uh, and is no longer in the ministry. It, it's not like you... <laughs> you arrive at a, at a certain point where Satan goes, well, that guy's been walking with the Lord 50 years. I just give up on him. That, that's not going to happen. Uh, we still have to be uh, diligent. Uh, and there's some horrible things in terms of attack against uh, men in this country, uh, in particular, that's destroying families. And I just have to mention it when we come across it once in a while. According to some statistics from Josh McDowell, currently, 50% uh, of the pastors in America view pornography on the internet. That's the pastors. 65% uh, of uh, Christian men. 38%, uh, almost 40% of those guys become completely addicted, and it is addictive. It is a thrill, and there's a chemical that's injected into your body and into your brain, and it's addictive like heroin and, and cocaine. Uh, and it absolutely destroys guys, it destroys their marriages, it destroys their families. And Satan watches and he watches and he provides opportunity. And it's just one way. That's just one thing. Uh, we need to be very careful because there is a scheme. It gets worse. The scheme is part of a conspiracy. That's in, the, in verse 12. 
Uh, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, uh, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now Paul uses the same language in, in Colossians 2.9. Uh, let me read a couple of these verses and then we'll talk about it because these are obviously authorities. Colossians 2 9, For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head over all principality uh, and power. Uh, in verse 15 of that same chapter of Jesus and his death on the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing uh, over them uh, in it. So there are these uh, rankings. So within the, the it's almost like a de demonic military, and there are commanding officers. Uh, there's NCOs, and it goes all the way down to the privates. You know, sometimes you might say, uh, come home from a tough day and say, man, honey, it's a rough day. The devil was all over me today. I really doubt that he was, but it might have been one of his privates or maybe even a corporal, you know. I think the higher ranking guys are uh, out after the, uh, the people that are leading uh, big ministries and, uh, and uh, government officials uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a, a, a concerted effort. Uh, there is a conspiracy, in a sense, living in a fallen world of demonic entities that apparently are well organized trying to bring down the downfall of this world. We see a little bit of it in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, Daniel, of course, uh, uh, is the young teenager who is taken uh, into, cap into the Babylonian captivity, uh, grows up uh, under it, uh, uh, willing to give up his life if necessary, but he was going to remain faithful to God. Uh, and certainly one of the wonderful character studies uh, in the Bible. Uh, he is older in chapter 10, and he's been in prayer uh, for three weeks. He received a vision uh, in answer to that prayer uh, after fasting for uh, three weeks. And it's very possible uh, that he's gotten news back uh, from uh, those that had gone with Ezra. Ezra is now returned. He's at the end of the captivity. Uh, he is, uh, Ezra has gone back to uh, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and there's some real concern about the difficult situation and the conditions that they're experiencing there. Uh, and Daniel uh, describes uh, a powerful being in verses 4 to 6. Uh, and then in verses uh, 7 and 9, he describes his own weakness uh, in, uh, in this, this being's uh, present, the spiritual entity that, uh, that comes to him. Uh, and then uh, this is what this powerful being says to Daniel uh, in, uh, in chapter 10, verse 10. Daniel writing, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now uh, been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I've come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings, plural, of Persia. Now I have come to you to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So there's this powerful spiritual entity, this angel, very powerful angel. It comes to Daniel. Daniel's a godly man. You know, he's he's you know he's been in the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. He's uh, obviously uh, in his 80s or, or, or older now. Walked with the Lord for decades and decades. But when this uh, angel shows up, he's he's trembling. He's he's on his face. And the angel has to convince him to get up. <coughs> and he says, "I stood there, but I was still trembling." And then he begins to tell me that from the moment you prayed, the moment you sent that message to God and you prayed, your message was heard immediately. I came to deliver the answer, but I couldn't get through. I've been battling the kings or the princes of Persia for many days now, and I couldn't get through. And he's not talking about an angel. One angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. So we're not talking about him being resisted uh, by a literal king or prince of Persia. 
It's a spiritual entity, like we're talking about, the powers and principalities. He says, I've been struggling. Obviously, this is a very powerful angel. He says, but then uh, Michael came. Michael's an archangel. He's a bad dude on a good note. And he says, when he came, he dealt with that guy. Then I was able to get through and answer your prayer. Wouldn't that make an awesome movie? I'm just saying. <laughs> Can't they tell these stories? But uh, and so he delivers the message. Uh, that's a tremendous insight into this whole idea of spiritual warfare. When you and I pray, something happens in the heavens. There's a warfare going on. We can ignore it. We can deny it. Uh, we can uh, become preoccupied with it. Everything is is that. <clears throat> the fault of spiritual warfare and so forth. Uh, both extremes are, are bad, but certainly we need to be aware of it and understand what happens when we pray and we begin to intercede for ourselves or for someone else or an event that's coming up where someone might get saved. There's a battle that goes on in the heavenlies. I think when we'll get to heaven, we're going to understand this a lot better <clears throat> and, uh, and they're going to be like, shoots. <laughs> probably should have been praying a lot more. You know, we'll, we'll actually be able to see the reality of it that we miss uh, so much in this life. The book of Revelation tells us about unclean and evil spirits <clears throat> that influence leaders of nations to gather them against the nation of Israel. And we're kind of marvel about this uh, now, aren't we? I mean, if we study Bible prophecy, if we're familiar with the nation of Israel, uh, and we watch the, the nations of the world uh, turning against them, Somehow, tiny Israel in the middle, tiny Israel, surrounded by their, their enemies, somehow they're the bad guys. They're, they're David against Goliath. Uh, but the news media has flipped it and made them to be Goliath. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. And we're watching the growing anti-Semitism around the world, especially uh, in Western Europe, where we thought it would never happen uh, again. Uh, because of the Holocaust and so forth. Uh, it's like, what is driving this? How, this is not even logical. It's not even, uh, not even reasonable by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, well, there's, there's demonic entities at work, again, ruling and, and going against and whispering into the hearts and minds uh, of national leaders. And that's why uh, we certainly are exhorted to pray for those leaders and government officials that are, that are over us. But there's a particular plan. It's part of a conspiracy. Uh, and, uh, and this is where I think it becomes very practical if we understand the circumstances now. The scheme primarily attacks our minds. And again, the, the uh, scheme of the enemy may, may involve our eyes in terms of temptation and so forth, what we hear with our ears. Uh, but most of this battle so far that he's discussing takes place right within our own minds. Uh, look at verse 12 again. For we do not wrestle against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The idea in the original language when it says wrestle, some translations say struggle, it's, it's wrestle in us. Uh, we do not wrestle in us uh, alone. Uh, it's, uh, it's not against flesh and blood. It's in us is where the battle uh, really takes place. Uh, the scheme involves a broad range of activity, uh, including attacks on our minds, our emotions. Uh, the results that come to us then are condemnation, doubt, fear, evil thoughts, uh, and depression. Uh, I mean, do you ever just have a day and you wake up and you, you just feel really condemned, uh, even as a Christian? Even though it's very clear in Scripture, therefore there is now no, and we've talked about it, it's like a double negative in the English, there is now no, no not ever, any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's what we know in the Word of God. Do you ever feel condemned? Where does that thought come from? Uh, it, comes from it comes from the enemy. Uh, guilt, uh, depression. Again, uh, notice the, uh, how Satan attacked King David uh, to sin in 1 Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles 21.1 it says, then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. How did he move him? He put the thought uh, in, in his mind. Uh, look at how he affects that Judas and his betrayal of Jesus in John 13, 2. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Uh, he put the thought uh, into his heart 
uh, and into his mind. But here's four examples to show how the devil can affect the way we think uh, and the way we feel, because most of the battle, I think, is right between the ears uh, most of the time. Uh, it can be certainly be visual. It can be other things. We'll talk about them as we get to uh, putting on the full armor. Uh, but it really begins in the mind. The first one, as I mentioned, is condemnation. It produces guilt, leaves the victim with a sense of hopelessness. It is different from conviction. Conviction is a legitimate work of the Holy Spirit that actually draws us to the Lord. You can tell the difference. Uh, uh, conviction is showing you something that is sinful in your life, something that's pleasing to God, and God is using that to draw you to Him so that you'll ask for forgiveness and be reconciled. It's actually driving you and bringing you closer to the cross and to Jesus Christ. Condemnation pushes you the other way. You're not worthy. You call yourself a Christian. You think God will forgive you again? How many times have you sinned this way anyway? You know, grace doesn't really work. <laughs> that, that's all those thoughts, that's, that's from the enemy. We're to take up the shield of faith, uh, which is the word of God. Again, in that case, uh, as we've mentioned uh, Romans 8, 1 already, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, but again, uh, we, it's hard to take up the shield if we've never put the belt of truth on. Because <laughs> we won't have the shield with us when, uh, when we need it. Uh, so those, those aspects of these weapons are very important, but condemnation to the mind is one of the tactics of the enemy in spiritual warfare. Fear is another one. Satan threats us with evil consequences if we trust uh, and obey him. He'll threaten us with uh, sudden destruction. He'll threaten us when, uh, with circumstances that seem to be out of control, uh, although, although very not. We call it uh, in the vernacular the what-ifs. You ever get into the what ifs? Well, what if that happens? Oh man, then what if that happens? Oh, then it's going to be worse because if that happens, then, oh man, that could happen. Then it doesn't matter what your job, your house, I don't care what's going on, your kids' grades at school, or whatever it is, the car that, uh, what if the car breaks down? You know, we're pretty tight already. I don't even know how we'd get it. You know, you just start, you start going there, uh, and you just end up praising the Lord, don't you? No, and you just, you just, you're, you're like this spiral, and, you, and it just goes down. Uh, it brings fear. Uh, in, into your life. I love the example of the uh, 18th century uh, 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 George Whitfield, the great uh, uh, revivalist. Uh, he called upon his friend John Wesley to uh, join him in open air preaching. We don't, we don't think anything of it other than the fact you need a really good sound system. But uh, in those days, everything was done in the church. These guys were absolutely condemned because they had the, they had the nerve to actually <laughs> go out and preach in a, in a factory or a coal mine or wherever people were, because you don't do those things. It's always done in the church and very proper and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, Whitfield had been uh, very successful leading uh, you know, uh, thousands of people to faith in Christ and told Wesley you should do the same. Just get out, preach the gospel where the people were at. Uh, he was invited to do that. Uh, and he writes it, that he was suddenly struck with the impression that if he were to do that, he would die. Uh, having sought divine uh, uh, guidance, he ra randomly opened his Bible on four different occasions. Uh, and each of the verses he came to uh, seemed to confirm his fear of death. I, I don't know, that just kind of cracks me up a little bit. That John Wesley, <laughs> seeking God's will, takes his Bible and goes, <laughs> what does it say? Don't do that. That is not a good, you know, but it's like, what do you do? Uh, Judas went and hung himself. Go and do likewise. You know, I mean, you know, get some bad answers in you know, Bible roulette. Yeah, don't, don't do that. But it kind of cracks me up that John Wesley did it because uh, he was so afraid to do what God wanted him to do. Uh, uh, and it was, uh, it was actually through that acceptance he finally decided, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Uh, and he goes on and has a tremendous, as you know, evangelistic career where uh, for over 50 years, leading to the conversion of tens of thousands uh, of people to faith in Christ. Something that was uh, incredibly fearful to him. First John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love uh, and, a, and of a sound, a sound mind. And I've, uh, I think I've told you the story of being in... Um, in Calcutta one time, and, uh, and uh, we visited, uh, we were there for the day, and we visited um, 
Mother Teresa's work, and we down there, right down the street at Kali's temple. Kali is a very evil, a very evil god in uh, in India. Kali's the one that tells uh, young mothers to uh, take their infant child and, and throw them in the Ganges River as an offering uh, to uh, to him and, and other horrific things, all under the guise. And people are there are very afraid of him. We're uh, Mike Singel and I uh, are from North Shore Christian Fellowship. Are there with a couple of. Uh, uh, Indian guys from southern India. We'd been doing a conference up in the north, uh, and we were uh, on our way back, and we happened to be in the city. And uh, Mike says, "You got to see see this. They still do blood sacrifices in here. I mean, they're they're cutting goats' heads off, and blood goes flying. And of course, the <coughs> the the person that's paid for the offering is on their knees before it when that happens, so that they can take the blood and then dip it uh, on their on their forehead and so forth." He goes, yeah, this is one of the only times you're ever going to see actual live, still, you know, sacrifices like this. Uh, you you got to see this. And these guys were afraid to go in because they were Indian. I mean, they, they knew who Kali was. And we, we <laughs> Mike had to spend about 15 minutes going through this verse that he, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They were afraid to go in. We don't have to be afraid to go in. Uh, Satan can't touch us. God lives within us. God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us. He fears us. We don't have to fear him. But he can get it into our minds that we have to, have to fear him. And he's, he's good at it. I mean, this has been um, uh, more than one occasion in my life. I wake up in the middle of the night dreadfully fearful, and I don't even know why. And as I lay there sweating, trying to figure out this tremendous fear that's come over me, uh, what is, and I have to realize and kind of, man, I... I don't know what I'm doing or about to do or what God's about to do in or through me or whatever, but man, I'm under I'm under attack here, and uh, I need to. I just had this. I just have to get out of bed and start start praying till the thing lifts and it goes away. And I start reciting these scriptures and going through the scriptures and uh, bringing them to my my own remembrance. It's a tactic uh, of the enemy. Uh, Paul says this very very helpful to the church in in, uh, in Philippi and. In Philippians 4 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, I mean, what do you do under these circumstances? This is what you do. Whatever is true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if any, uh, there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things, on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. We can actually get our minds on other things that he uh, recommends here. He says, and the peace of God will, uh, will begin to come to our hearts once again. Uh, the third thing, uh, one of the tactics of the enemy, is depression. Depression, as one writer said, may be the most devastating of the schemes of the devil because he gathers up condemnation, doubt, fear, evil thoughts, and imaginations wraps them in despair and leaves you with an overwhelming sense of, of hopelessness. And I have to tell you, if you're not aware, uh, there's a lot of Christians that suffer uh, depression. We're getting ready to go to Japan. <coughs> and um, uh, because uh, Japan is uh, one of the most unreached uh, countries without the gospel, uh, you see it uh, in, the, in the lives of the people there. Less than one half of 1% uh, know, know the Lord. Another, another, I think the, uh, the number of Christians in Iran today is, is more like 8 or 9 percent. You know, so I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of baffling. Uh, but you see it in the country. Uh, I remember one of the pastors there talking about, uh, <coughs> we were riding the train and stuff, and there was a little delay, and he was a little concerned, uh, because it was a growing trend for people to throw themselves in front of the train. And when it does, everything stops, and that, that whole prefecture and everything, so they you know, figure out what was going on and, uh, and so forth. And he was talk talking to me about the number of classmates from high school that, uh, that have died of suicide. There's a huge proportion. When you don't know Jesus Christ, there's no, no sense of hope in people's lives. They battle depression tremendously. But uh, so do Christians everywhere. Uh, and we see it even in the Psalms. Certainly David was a guy. If you read the Psalms, David definitely battled depression at times. Uh, Asaph writing in Psalm 77 verse 2 says, In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Uh, and he goes on. There's a lot of psalms like that. And then they kind of turn a corner. But I entered the sanctuary of the Lord. 
or that I began to think about the plight, what would happen, the eternal destiny of the evil that seemed to be triumphing around me. And he, and he gets, gets in a relationship with God to kind of uh, list from him and so forth. Uh, Paul seemed certainly to have his struggles as well. 2, 2 Corinthians 1.8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brother, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired uh, even of life. I want to see, read you a little quote from Charles Spurgeon, but uh, if you're not familiar with Spurgeon, I came across this uh, slide, and it's just a drawing, but it gives you a sense of Spurgeon. He packed it out. People would stand in the snow outside to hear this guy, this guy preach. Uh, I mean, just uh, a tremendous... Tremendous ministry and a great influence on, uh, on people, the uh, guys in the ministry today. But Spurgeon wrote this, even with all of his uh, uh, the success and the way the Lord used him. He says, I of all men am perhaps the subject of the deepest depression at times. Depression so fearful, I hope, that uh, none. Excuse me. Turn one page too many. That none of you ever get such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. Uh, that, that's Spurgeon. Uh, the fact that you're a godly person and greatly uh, being used by God or not uh, doesn't mean that you won't ever have to battle this. Sometimes it's a, an attack by the enemy. Now, everyone suffers depressions at times, and there's uh, basically uh, four types of depression. Uh, one is organic, and uh, I'm, I'm not giving uh, medical advice here. I'm just going to give you a couple, a little breakdown here. Uh, one's organic. It's just the bodily function, hormonal, chemical imbalance, fatigue, unhealthy eating, <laughs> post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, traumatic head injuries. Those guys really, really battle, especially when they have a combination of, uh, of both. Uh, it's organic. You, you, you probably need uh, some help, uh, change of lifestyle, whatever, whatever it might be. Circumstantial. The problems of life get get you down. It's just sometimes you're you're uh, <laughs> you talk to people and they're depressed and you hear their story and you think, man, I'd be depressed too. <laughs> you know, it's like you're going through all that. I, I think that's you, yeah. You probably need to take a little break here and just you know. Uh, and maybe that person needs some help. And so, just circumstances can uh, can be overwhelming at times. Uh, uh, sometimes it's it's sin related. Uh, we're we're in sin and uh, and we're not repentant, uh, and it, it can be very very depressing. Uh, sometimes it's a again a satanic attack. It's, and that's just it. Uh, if the cause is organic, uh, sometimes we need treatment. Sometimes it's medical. Uh, if it's circumstantial, uh, we need the treatment that we get from a, a biblical perspective and from trusting God and to be able to see our circumstances from uh, from God's perspective once again. And that all things do really work for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. If the cause is sin, then we repent. Uh, if the cause is satanic, then we take out our spiritual weapons and, uh, and, we, uh, and we deal with it. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's just hard to know, but... Uh, I would say the spiritual weapons are never a bad idea, no matter what, what the, the cause. But sometimes it's just simply uh, an attack of the enemy. The fourth example uh, is, uh, again, of the attack within us. The devil can affect the way that we think and feel is uh, maybe the one we're more familiar with, temptation. This is a solicitation to do evil. And certainly Satan tempts Christians. Uh, uh, David's sin with Bathsheba gave great occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme God. Uh, Satan hates us, uh, and uh, he learns how to identify what temptations he can bring to us. Uh, he is very subtle. Uh, again, he can appear as an angel of light, a damsel in distress, the solution to your financial problems, uh, the answer to your poor self-image, and the list goes on and on. What you need, he can show up and provide it for you. It's actually a pitfall, though. It's a temptation. Paul Roy writes this again to, uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Temptation is often and usually very subtle. Uh, and when faced with it, we can either rationalize our behavior we can compromise our character, or we can disobey the word of God. It's usually going to play on, on one of those three things. Uh, and when it comes, we need to put on the full armor of God and get ready to do, to do battle. So there's an urgency in taking a stand. 
as a believer in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I need to exchange my weakness for God's power. There's a warning against the scheme. Uh, and being aware of it helps us understand uh, Satan and his attempt to draw us into battle. And of course, uh, he's going to teach us then uh, how to engage uh, the, the enemy. This is simply just uh, the, uh, the introduction. But if you're going through it and you sense one of these things, and some of this have resonated with you this morning, I would suggest you follow the example of the Apostle Paul, which in verse 19 said uh, that he was asking for prayer. And uh, let me just remind you of a couple things. This is Paul who wore the spiritual armor over two continents. Uh, he marched his way on foot across the entire Roman Empire. Five times he received the 39 lashes. That means this guy had 195 scars across his back. He did miracles. He stood before kings and emperors. Uh, but despite all of that, uh, when he saw it coming, he asked for prayer. Uh, and that's a good thing. Find someone who will pray for you and pray with you uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and learn as we go through how to put on uh, the full armor of God. I saved a quote from uh, <coughs> from a few years ago when uh, we went up for uh, Josh's <coughs> graduation at the Air Force Academy. Uh, it's his uh, squadron uh, graduation. There's a little uh, booklet. You know, there's a thousand guys, so you, you actually uh, go to his uh, when he's going to get uh, his uh, second lieutenant bars pinned on. So it's uh, it's a very cool ceremony, and there was a. Uh, a little booklet they did for each of the guys and the gals, uh, you know, the picture and, you know, the baby picture and then the class picture and then some quote uh, in everything. Some of the guys are Christians. They'll put a Bible first, different things. Uh, but um, uh, Josh, Josh put uh, this one. It's from a, uh, a Greek uh, philosopher, uh, Heraclitus, uh, 500 B.C., uh, and he said this. <clears throat> out of every hundred men, ten sh uh, in terms of a battle, out of every hundred men, ten should not be there. Uh, Eighty are nothing but targets, and nine are the real fighters, and we are blessed to have them, for they the battle make. Ah, but one, one of them is a warrior, and he will bring the others home. And uh, uh, there's a lot of young guys in the military that are very familiar with that, that particular quote. Uh, and I say it related to this way. Uh, God hasn't called us as Christians to be bullet stoppers uh, for the kingdom of God. He's actually called us all to be warriors. Uh, and it makes me think of the, the line from Judges 6.12 uh, where Gideon uh, is uh, hiding in a cave, uh, afraid of the enemy. He's threshing a sweet in a cave because he doesn't want the bad guys to come steal it from him. Uh, and at that point, the Lord says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior." Well, he wasn't looking like a mighty warrior at the time, but God knew who he could be. Uh, God knew who, who he could be if he would stand in his power uh, and understand the battle that was, uh, that was taking place. Uh, and the question is here, are, are, you ready, are you ready to go to war? <laughs> you can live in denial, you can overemphasize, uh, but we need to be able to realize when we're under attack, stand in God's power, ask for prayer when we need it, and uh, as we go through it, Learn how to put on the full armor of God. Amen.
Change your mind. 